welcome everyone. I'm Angie Moxley with Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville, Georgia. I support this webinar of technology for University of Georgia Extension and would like to introduce to you the host of this webinar series. Dr. Dan Suter is a professor of urban pest management in the Department of Entomology at the University of Georgia. He is located on the UGA Griffin campus. Dr. Suter has worked with the pest control industry since 1987. And Dan would like to welcome you and introduce you to our speaker. Dan? Thank you, Angie. And again, welcome, everybody. Uh, our first speaker up is Dr. Nancy Hinkle. Uh, Dr. Hinkle is the University of Georgia's professor of uh, veterinary entomology, where she studies blood sucking arthropods that affect uh, animals like cats and dogs, chickens, cows, horses, goats, pigs, sheep, and, and wildlife. Uh, she received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Auburn University in Alabama and her PhD from the University of Florida. She teaches medical entomology and has been on the UGA faculty at the main campus in Athens since 2001. So welcome, Nancy, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Suter. Appreciate it. And I am very impressed with all you folks who got up early this morning. And we appreciate those of you on the other side of the globe who are staying up late tonight. Uh, appreciate your showing up. It's great to be with you. Looks like people are interested in fleas. Yes, as Dr. Suter said, they have experienced a resurgence. We're seeing more and more calls for pest control concerning fleas. Think about it. If a flea problem is easy to solve, then the pet owner is going to take care of it, the homeowner is going to get rid of the fleas, and you're never going to hear about it. But if it's a challenging situation, a recalcitrant situation, then that's the one that's going to show up in pest control. So those are really the ones we're going to be talking about today, the problems that are not easy to solve and the problems that show up on your doorstep and you get to deal with. There are a lot of fleas out there, over 2,200 species and subspecies. The vast majority of them are found on mammals. Just a few species are found on birds. And they are distributed worldwide. But despite so many, we're only going to talk about one today, the plain old cat flea. Uh, if you're interested in scientific names, the name there, Tennis Felides felis. The cat flea is the most common flea that's found on both cats and dogs, at least here in North America. For some reason in Europe, they do have the true dog flea, Tenocephalides felis canis, but we hardly ever see that one in North America. So if you find a flea on a dog here in North America, it's probably going to be the cat flea. Now this varies worldwide, so I won't try to address the fleas that you're going to find on dogs in other countries, but you probably know what's going on in your situation. We'll talk about the cat flea today. There are a lot of similarities to other fleas, but you can't always guarantee that the life cycle and behavior and biology are going to be exactly identical. So of course, look up the fleas that you're working with. With any pest, it's always essential to identify the pest before we start trying to develop control strategies. Why are we interested in fleas? Well, they bite. They suck blood. Unfortunately, this has a lot of impact on some animals. For some reason, some animals, particularly dogs, are highly allergic to the salivary secretions of fleas. And they will develop this condition called flea allergy dermatitis. This is a severe allergic reaction to the salivary secretions that causes the animal to itch intensely. And they will scratch, they will bite, they will lick, they will attempt to alleviate this discomfort. And it can be very irritating to the poor animal. That's one reason we're concerned about fleas. Of course, they do bite humans as well. Fortunately, humans don't generally react as severely as animals do, but some people do. There are people who are hyperallergenic to fleas as well, so they develop these sorts of symptoms. Most of us develop a transitory itching. We get over it, but it's still annoying. People don't want fleas around. Fleas are blood suckers. They have to have a blood meal. So every one of them is going to look for a warm-blooded creature to feed from. This generally is a dog or cat, but if they're desperate, they will attempt to feed from humans. They will suck our blood. However, for some reason, our blood is not uh, sufficient, it's not satisfactory for their life cycle. So they will not maintain a population just on a human subject. If you are locked in a room with fleas and they have nothing else to feed on but you, 
they will feed on you, they will survive long enough, but, but they will not be able to produce a next generation. So you don't have to worry about sustained populations based just on humans, thank goodness. These are fleas. Uh, on the left there, you've got a bunch of fleas. On my arm, sucking blood, as you can see, they're also desiccating blood. That's what comes out the rear end after they've sucked it in through the front end. And then over on the right there, you've got a scanning electron micrograph showing a flea in feeding position with its mouth parts inserted in the skin and its rear end sticking up in the air. Notice those spines sticking on it. This is one reason that fleas are so challenging to remove from the coat of your cat or dog, because those spines get wrapped up in all the fur and it's very hard to remove them. Kind of like removing a cocklebur from the coat of an animal. Here's more scanning electron micrographs, just showing you the difference between a boy flea and a girl flea. The boy flea is over on the left, the girl's on the right. Uh, if you were going to make a science fiction movie, why would you use something like this? I just think they're dramatically distinctive creatures. They would make great movie stars. And this is uh, the mating position of fleas. The little male, as you can see, is on the bottom there, and the female mounts him on top, and then he exerts his ediagus and inserts it into the female and affects the copulation that way. So that's how the female gets inseminated. She's then ready to lay eggs. She produces eggs, as uh, shown here again, another scanning electron micrograph. This is what a flea leg egg looks like up close. The eggs are laid while the flea is still on the host. Fleas, cat fleas at least, once they've found a host, do not leave that host except under duress. They want to stay on that host. So the female is on the host. She's sucking blood. She's defecating. She's laying eggs. The male's also on the host. He's feeding. He's mating. He's uh, defecating. The female laying the eggs, of course, the eggs are not sticky, so they don't stick to the fur of the host. They tend to just sift through the coat of the animal fall off into the environment and collect in the host environment. So wherever the host is spending a lot of time, that's where you're going to find concentrations of flea eggs. Therefore, the more you know about the host behavior, the more likely you can predict where you're going to find the concentrations of fleas in the home. So for instance, you've got this cat. Say this cat's infested with fleas. While the cat's napping there, you've got fleas defecating. You've got female fleas laying their eggs. What's the first thing this cat's going to do when she wakes up from her nap? Yeah, anybody that knows cats knows they're going to, she's going to stand up, shake, scratch a little bit, then jump down and go look for a food, food bowl. Uh, that's what cats do. So the concentration of flea eggs is going to be right around this sofa, probably right behind the sofa, where the flea eggs are going to collect. When they hatch, you're going to have a concentration of flea larvae behind the sofa. So again, knowing about the host behavior can give you real insight into where the concentration of flea population is going to be. Same thing with this dog. What's the dog going to do when she wakes up from her nap? She's going to stand up, scratch a couple of times, and then trot off to find her food bowl. So same behavior. You're going to have a large concentration of flea eggs and flea larvae right around the dog bed. So this is what we're talking about. Here you've got the pretty uh, flea eggs, they're kind of that pearly white, those are the flea eggs, and then the flea fecal material, the adult feces fecal material there is those black stripes, that's what the adult flea defecates, and it turns out there's a real advantage to this because, interestingly enough, the newly hatched flea larvae feed on adult flea feces. So when these little larvae hatch out of these eggshells here, the larvae are going to crawl around and they're going to start feeding on that black material there, which again is just the fecal material from their parents. This is just partially digested blood, so it still has a lot of nutritive value. It's beneficial to the larvae that are coming out of those um, eggshells there. So that's how the population gets started. Uh, just to give you a little in, uh, idea of how large these eggs are, they're only about half a millimeter long, as you can see on this grid here. Pretty nondescript and pretty small, so hard to see. The little larva then hatches out of the eggshell there. That's a new, newly hatched flea larva right there. Again, pretty nondescript. This is what the flea larva looks like after it's been feeding for a few days. They don't have legs. They don't have eyes. They don't have ears. They really don't have a distinct head. They're pretty bland little creatures. They look a lot like a maggot with a few hairs sticking out of it. You notice that dark material down the middle of it? 
that's the flea digestive system. The larval flea, again, has been feeding on adult flea feces. That's what that material is, and that's why it's dark. So the flea larva crawls around in the environment, and because it's blind, it does not have eyes, it feeds rather indiscriminately, just kind of grazes on whatever organic material is in its environment. And as I mentioned, it feeds particularly on adult flea feces. This is, again, what the flea larva looks like, a scanning electron micrograph showing one. They have a behavior. When they're disturbed, they coil up like a snake. Now, this has advantages if you're living in something like a carpet, because when you curl up like this, you wrap your body around the carpet fibers. That allows flea larvae to remain pretty severe, securely in a carpet, even when you're vacuuming over them. And so even good sanitation using a vacuum can be uh, not completely sufficient to eliminate flea larvae from the carpet. But we do certainly encourage vacuuming because not only do you remove, remove some of the flea larvae, you remove the eggs before they hatch, and you remove the flea fecal material, the eggs or the food that they're feeding on. So you can starve the flea larvae to death even if you don't remove all of them. Think about it. If you were a flea larva crawling around down in a carpet, you're awfully small compared to your surroundings. So look here, you've got a carpet that's been cut in half. So you're looking at the carpet backing there on the bottom. And then you've got the carpet fibers extending up kind of like a forest. Then you've got the little flea larva. If you look right there in the middle, you see the little flea larva crawling around. It's down near the base of the carpet so that it's crawling there and it's you see it right there okay, with the little box there. Uh, it's crawling around in there and feeding, again, indiscriminately on whatever organic material it can find. That's how flea larvae live. And our challenge, of course, is trying to kill those little creatures that are pretty well protected way down at the base of the carpet fibers, which, again, is pretty much kind of like flying over a forest and trying to kill the little creatures that are down at the base of all those huge trees that are extending up there. That's the challenge. OK, we've had the eggs hatched. The larvae have been crawling around, eating, growing. Now the larvae are ready to pupate. And to do so, the larvae spin silk cocoons. These silk cocoons are sticky, so the debris in the environment adheres to these sticky fibers. And you'll notice here that you can actually see sand grains that have been adhering to the silk. This camouflages the cocoon, making it look like a dirt clod. Or a, if you're in the carpet, it's going to look like a lint ball because it'll be surrounded by lint fibers. If you open this cocoon soon after the larva has pupated, the larva can be seen coiled up inside. So there's the flea larva. The head is sticking out there. You see the little head sticking out. And then you've got the uh, body coiled up inside the flea cocoon there. If you wait a few days and then let the larva complete its development inside the cocoon and you open it, you will find a pupa inside. So on the left there, you've got the cocoon vastly magnified, again, with the scanning electron microscope. You can see the sand grains there adhering to the silk. And then on the right, you've got the pupa. When you open up that cocoon and extract the creature that's inside, this is what it looks like now over on the right. The pupa, of course, you can see the legs extending down, six legs. You can see the head up at the top and the abdomen down at the bottom. But it definitely doesn't look like a flea yet. It's still wrapped up in the pupal skin. So you uh, wait a few more days, and you leave it inside the cocoon, let it complete its development instead of removing it, and you'll get a flea. So all of this is going on inside the cocoon. This is the, the flea. It's still inside the cocoon. The cocoon has been open. You can actually see the silk lining there with the flea down inside. You see those spiky legs sticking out? We're looking at the rear end of the abdomen there, and you can see the hind legs as well. So within this cocoon, the larva has gone from the larval stage through the pupal stage to the adult flea. And I'm making a big deal of this because this is a real challenge for pest management. These fleas can stay within this cocoon, protected there, for weeks, months. We're actually not even sure what the upper limit is, how long they can stay in there. But if there's not a host nearby, if there's no stimulus for them to come out of their cocoon, they can stay protected within the cocoon for months. 
And you have probably run into this if you've been in pest control for any length of time. If you had an account where a house or an apartment was closed up for several months and then you went in and all of a sudden you were covered up to your knees with fleas, that's probably what was going on there. The previous occupants of that uh, home had been, uh, had been pet owners. They had dogs or cats that had fleas. When they left, they left behind the flea larvae. The flea larvae continued to graze in the carpet. They ate up all the food. They pupated. And then they sat there inside those cocoons and waited. And there was nothing to stimulate them to come out of the cocoons. There were no warm-blooded creatures running around. So they just sat there and waited and waited. And then you came into the apartment, and you were a warm-blooded creature. And you stimulated them to emerge from the cocoon. And they all came out at once. It's amazing how rapidly they can perceive a host, come out of the cocoon, and hop toward the host and land on the host. So this is the challenge that we run into. What do you do about all of these cocoons containing fleas just ready to emerge and start sucking blood? I'll tell you right off, we don't have an answer for this yet. But you need to be forewarned. You need to know that this is a situation you're going to run into, very likely. And then, of course, the adult flea comes out, hops over to the host, lands on the host, and starts sucking blood again. And fleas are not very smart. They're not very coordinated. They can jump really high, but they can't jump very well, or not coordinated. They can't really orient themselves well. So what they do is just fling themselves at the host, and they've got these little hooks on the ends of their feet, so they hope that eventually the hooks will catch, and they'll be able to attach themselves to the host. And they're usually successful. So they end up on the dog's coat, burrow down into the coat, start sucking blood. So to reiterate the life cycle, the eggs, the eggs usually hatch in just a few days, well, one to four days. Usually a couple of days the eggs hatch. The larvae then crawl around in the carpet, or if they're outdoors, they crawl around in the sand. They feed any organic material. It takes uh, two, or th uh, two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, depending on temperature. Like all insects, these developmental cycles are dependent on temperature. The larva within a month then has converted into the pupal stage within the cocoon. It has spun the cocoon, and within this cocoon it has converted into the pupal stage, and then it goes on and converts into the adult stage within still that cocoon. So you'll notice the question mark there. We don't know how many months it can spend inside this cocoon. And then a host presence stimulates it to emerge. Usually this involves uh, smelling car carbon dioxide. That's one way they know a host is nearby. Or the heat from a warm body can stimulate it to emerge. Or movement, if the vibrations of the floor, they can perceive that the host is nearby by that as well. But carbon dioxide is just almost magical. It will cause the adult flea to come from the cocoon almost immediately. Then the adult emerges. And typically, the adult lives about two weeks. Of course, it depends on uh, what kind of mortality factors it encounters when it's out in the world. And host grooming, actually. Cats and dogs are very good at biting fleas off their body. And that's uh, one of the major mortality factors for adult fleas. Now, I have to mention that control of fleas is a multifaceted problem. We depend somewhat on the control of fleas on the pet. And so this is where the veterinarian and the homeowner get involved. Fleas, of course, have to have a warm-blooded host. So sooner or later, they're going to have to find an animal or a person and feed on that animal. For instance, uh, one of the pro many of the projects that we, excuse me, many of the products that we have now for flea control are liquids that are applied in very small amounts to the coat of the animal. They dissolve in skin oils and disperse readily over the entire surface of the body. And this is things like Frontline and Advantage. Those are two very common ones that are formulated this way. Again, you have a very small volume of the material, and just a few drops of it are placed on the skin, typically between the shoulder blades. This material, again, is lipophilic, so it dissolves in the skin oils, and then over a period of time will disperse throughout the coat of the animal. We must mention that since they dissolve in skin oils, the animal must have some skin oils for these products to act correctly. So if you put, wash your dog and then let the animal dry and then immediately apply one of these compounds, 
you've washed off all the skin oil, so there's nothing there for the material to dissolve in, and it will sit exactly where it's applied and never get to the rump or the belly or the rest of the body. This is one thing that for some reason veterinarians don't tell pet owners, but you might mention it if they are using a product like Frontline or Advantage and they're not pleased with its performance, you might ask, well, when's the last time you washed your dog? You don't want to wash the dog for two or three weeks before you use one of these materials because if you do so, the coat will be too dry for the material to function properly. I mentioned Advantage is another one. You, you recognize the active ingredient in the Clopid. You've heard it in other brand names. This is what Advantage is. It's used on pets. Frontline is Fipronil. You've also heard that one is another brand name. Uh, it's used on animals for the same, same way, a little of this material applied between the shoulder blades. And it claims a month's worth of control from a single application. Now, historically, this was true. It, functioned extremely well when it first came on the market. Uh, we are getting reports now that it's not performing quite as well. We may be seeing resistance, but nobody is monitoring this to find out whether or not that's true. There's another formulation of Frontline that's a spray, but since cats and dogs generally don't like the sound of hissing sprays, we don't see it being used as frequently. I must mention when I mention Frontline, I have to say Frontline is also in a caricide, so it will also kill ticks. Advantage is not effective against ticks. Frontline is, however, quite effective against ticks as well as fleas. Now, there are over-the-counter products as well, some of which can be reasonably good for flea control. But as with all products, consumers should read and follow label directions. Notice in the upper left-hand corner of this package here, important, do not use on cats. And it's not kidding. This active ingredient is permethrin, a pyrethroid. For some reason, cats are highly susceptible to pyrethroid toxicity. Pyrethrins, pyrethroids will kill cats. It is a filicide. Uh, we don't really know why. Uh, the, more, the physiology of cats is different. They're just different animals. They're not little dogs. So when uh, Pyrethroid is applied to a cat, you develop uh, severe symptoms. Now, if you don't like cats, you may think this is fine, so you're killing a few cats. What's the problem there? Well, this doesn't kill cats in a nice way or a sanitary way. Generally, it produces both nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So you've got a cat that's spewing from both ends, running around, distributing this material everywhere. And it doesn't always actually kill the animal. Sometimes you end up with a cat that has neurological deficits. And if you think a cat's annoying when it's just normal, a cat that has neurological problems is a real problem. So. We don't recommend this method of killing cats, and we certainly don't recommend this method of controlling fleas on cats because you end up with worse problems than just fleas. There are a lot of products out there now for flea control on animals, and I don't expect every pest control operator to understand how each one of these works and which one can be used on cats and which ones can be used on dogs, which one's good for fleas and ticks and which one's only effective against fleas, which ones are given orally versus which ones are applied dermally. However, there is information available online. Uh, for instance, uh, we here in Georgia produce a publication called the Georgia Pest Management Handbook. You see it there in the lower left-hand corner of the name of the publication. Every year, we update this publication with a list of all the products that are available for flea control on cats and dogs. So if you're interested, you can go there. But remember, this is only applicable to products that are available and registered in Georgia. So you need to find out what's applicable for your region and follow the rules and regulations and laws applicable to where you live and work. But it may be helpful to know uh, what the veterinarians and what the pet owners are doing in addition to what you're doing for environmental pest control. Mention Capstar. This is one of those oral products. I was talking about the dermally applied products, like Frontline and Advantage. But we also have some orally applied products that are given as a pill, and the animal takes it, and that makes the blood poisonous to the fleas. Obviously, then the fleas have to feed on the blood, so you still have to have fleas feeding on the animal to get efficacy with these sorts of products. But they can be quite efficacious and kill a lot of fleas. 
again, the flea has to consume the blood, the blood has to be taken in, and that's how these products work. Whereas with the advantage in frontline, once the flea hops on the animal, it picks up enough of the insecticide to kill the flea without it having to necessarily feed. Now, when you've got a severe problem with fleas in a home, what do you do to knock the problem down quickly and get relief from fleas? Uh, that's what homeowners want. That's what your customers were looking for. They want the solution right now. Frankly, there are no chemicals that will do that. We do not have insecticides that will kill the fleas right now. So what I recommend is uh, consider using a steam cleaning device. Get in a company that does steam cleaning. We know that hot steam will kill fleas. It will kill the larvae down in the carpet. It will kill the pupae inside those cocoons. And it will kill the adult fleas. If it's hot enough, it will boil them. That's the whole idea. Uh, we're not talking chemical cleaning here. We're talking using hot live steam. So this is one way to knock down a population very quickly. Then I certainly recommend that pest control companies come in behind that once the carpet is dried and apply an, at least an insect growth regulator. If the customer doesn't want to use, quote, harsh chemicals, then you can come in with an insect growth regulator, and that will forestall the development of future flea problems. So you can prevent problems by using an insect growth regulator that will keep fleas from developing in the future. Again, getting back to knowing what the host is doing. If you know where the dog and cat are hanging out, those are areas where you can anticipate you're going to have your worst flea problem. So chat with the homeowner. Uh, sometimes the kids can be the most helpful members of the family for finding out this sort of information. Find out from the kids, where does the dog take its nap in the middle of the afternoon? Does the cat ever get up on the bed? All these uh, little bits of information can be very helpful as you do your inspection and try to find out where the flea concentrations are. As I mentioned earlier, I highly support the use of, ins of insect growth regulators. Methoprene and pyroproxifen, of course, are the ones that are available for us here in the United States. And I apologize to our customer, to our attendees from other parts of the world, but I'm not up on all the registrations around the world. You know what's available to you, and you know what works. So put together the plan that works for your situation. Uh, we're but consider insect growth regulators. They do add a component there where they will kill and control the larval stages uh, and forestall the development of adult fleas in the situation. Uh, these compounds, insect growth regulators, not only kill larvae, but they will penetrate the eggshell and kill the embryo within the egg of the flea as well. So on the left, we've got four eggs that have been treated with an insect growth regulator. As you'll notice, they're shriveled up. The larva inside the embryo has already been killed. These will never hatch, and you've stopped the flea problem right there. On the right, we have healthy flea eggs where the embryos are continuing to develop. They will hatch, and you, they will probably contribute to the flea problem. Uh, as with all treatments, we need to focus our applications where the problem is found. So again, if you've done a good inspection, found out where most of the fleas are concentrated, you spend most of your time and effort in those areas. Uh, exclude people and animals while making the application. Now, now notice, this picture here was staged, and that cat that you see in the background there is a ceramic cat. That is a statuette. That is not a live animal. <laughs> I know I should have moved it. I should not have taken this picture with the uh, putative animal still in there. So um, remove animals and people uh, when the application is being made. And as always, of course, follow the label instructions. And cat fleas are not restricted to just cats and dogs. They have a very wide host range. They're found on all canids, so foxes and wolves and coyotes and so on. They're found on uh, aphelids, so bobcats and mountain lions and tigers and lions and so on. Uh, cat fleas have a very wide host range. They're also found on opossums. They're found on raccoons. They're found on skunks. Uh, yes, you'll notice this is a dead skunk. I may not be too bright, but I know better than get close enough to a live skunk to take its picture. So I waited until I found a dead one on the side of the road. Uh, but these hosts are perfectly good for maintaining cat fleas. That means that every wild animal that wanders through your backyard at night can potentially be bringing in cat fleas to reinfest your yard and your pets. 
not to mention the feral animals, the cats and wild dogs and and neighborhood dogs that wander through the neighborhood and bring along their fleas to share with your cats and dogs as well. So there's always the potential for reinfestation. No matter how good a job you do of getting rid of fleas, there's always the chance they're going to come back. So we want to discourage wildlife from coming into our backyard, no matter how cute and adorable they may be. It's not a good idea. Uh, not to mention that most of the animals I just mentioned, especially skunks and raccoons, are carriers of diseases such as rabies. So we really don't want to encourage them to be spending time in our neighborhoods. Don't let them nest under our homes. This is probably one of the most common problems that we encounter. In the spring, possums, raccoons, skunks, etc., crawl under our homes because they're warm and they're dry and they're a great place to raise a family. So the possums and raccoons get under there, they have their babies, and then a few months, or well, weeks or months later, they, the babies have grown up and so they all leave. But they leave their fleas behind. And then a week or two later, the homeowner calls you and says, I've got fleas in my house. We don't have any cats and dogs. We don't have any pets. But all of a sudden, we've got fleas everywhere. Well, all those fleas that were in the crawl space have gotten hungry, and they have found ways into the living space of the home. They're small enough they can get through any opening, so uh, areas around pipes or any openings through the floorboards. They're going to get up into the living room, uh, living space of the home, and cause consternation among the occupants. So these are your challenges. Where are the fleas coming from? How did they get there? And how do you prevent this in the future? Well, if we can get our customers to seal up their homes, and uh, one of the ways is sealing up the crawl space, that's a real contribution to not having the problem repeated next spring. There are a lot of things on the web that are not true. I know that is a revelation to you, but not everything that you read on the web is true. For instance, you can get testimonials all over the place that yeast, brewer's yeast will solve flea problems. You feed your dog brewer's yeast and they'll never have fleas. Same with garlic. If you give your dog a garlic clove every day, he'll never have fleas. There, this is not true. Fleas don't care whether your dog or cat's own garlic or brewer's yeast or whatever. As long as the blood is sufficient to keep the animal alive, it is perfectly fine for fleas. Fleas will not care. They will be doing just well, really well. So don't worry about that. Uh, again, fleas, they're very small. I think everybody knows what, what we're talking about here. They have strong jumping legs. They do not have wings. There are no flying fleas. No fleas have wings. And they feed only on blood. So if they don't have a warm-blooded host that they can get a blood meal from, they will starve to death. They cannot eat plants. They cannot even drink water. They have to have blood. How about flea traps? Well, flea traps can be very useful to monitor, to ascertain whether fleas are present or not. And then, of course, you can collect the fleas and determine what species they are. So that's useful. However, there's no way we'll ever use traps to trap out a population of fleas. So that's not going to solve our flea problem. It's just a way of monitoring. And remember, not everything that is small and jumps is a flea. There are lots of little creatures that live around our homes or in our homes. For instance, Columbula, the little springtails. If you get a call from a customer and they say, I've got fleas in my bathtub, they're hopping around, and I, I want you to come and kill all these fleas. Well, if it's in the bathtub, it's probably not a flea. That's where I find a lot of springtails, and they're these cute little purple ones that are hopping around in the bathtub. They show up really well on the white porcelain. Uh, easy to control. In fact, they don't even need you. All they need to do is lower the humidity. These poor little springtails are so susceptible to desiccation. You just lower the humidity, run a fan for a couple of hours, and they'll all dry up and die. So they don't need chemicals. They don't need you even. They can just take care of that problem themselves. They're not bloodsuckers. Uh, fleet calimbalas or, excuse me, springtails are perfectly harmless. Can't bite or sting. Not a problem, really. Now, if you have fleas, and again, you've collected them, you've used the traps, or you've managed to get a sample somehow, 
you need to identify them. Uh, this is not necessarily easy. A lot of fleas look a lot alike. They're small. You're going to need a microscope to be able to see them adequately for identification. The Center for, Centers for Disease Control website has a pretty good key for identifying fleas. Uh, it's reasonably easy to use, good illustration, so that's what I would recommend. However, as you know, every state has an extension service that will uh, identify your fleas for you. So if you get specimens that you need identified, you can have it sent to the local university and identified there. And again, make sure you know what the problem is before you start trying to find a solution. Uh, if you're treating for fleas and the problem's not fleas, it's going to be very frustrating for you and the customer. As uh, most of you know, I deal a lot with the invisible bugs, uh, delusory parasitosis or Ekbom syndrome. These are people who think that they have an infestation of biting insects and they don't know what it is, and, but they want you to do something about it. Many of these people think that not only are they infested, but that their pet is infested as well. So they think their dog is infested with either invisible mites or fleas, and that's why it's always uh, incumbent on you to find out what the problem really is. So when you go in to do an inspection, make sure that you find out what the problem is before you start trying to solve it. If you're trying to get rid of invisible bugs that aren't there, how are you going to determine when you've been successful? Uh, so again, find the pest and adapt your modalities for treatment to the pest. If the individual is suffering from Ekbon syndrome, you may want to refer them to your competitor and have the, your competitor deal with that situation because it can be very frustrating. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, products that are available for use on the animals, I don't expect a pest control operator to know these, but you may find it helpful to be familiar with them, at least to recognize the names, the modes of action, and uh, assist the pet owner with combining those strategies with what you're doing for controlling the fleas in the home. For instance, if you find out that the imidacloprid product is not working on the dog, then you wouldn't be using imidacloprid for controlling the fleas. Pyrethroids, unfortunately, are not that effective against fleas. So you may find that the products that are available for use in the home are really not that good or not that effective against fleas. We don't have a wide range of products that are available for flea control. And again, this is just where your experience and your knowledge of products and uh, your, your, again, your experience, what you've done historically and that has worked. This is where you have the advantage. Uh, you do this as a, a profession. Uh, if you want to read more about fleas, there are a couple of publications available on my website. One we did for the World Health Organization, the link is up there at the top. More than you could ever want to know about fleas. And then, of course, if you have a, the 10th edition of Malice, um, we also have a ch chapter in there on ectoparasites, fleas, and lice with uh, an awful lot of information about fleas if you have more. Of course, if you have questions, we're ready to entertain those now. Most of you know how to find me. I'm available at the University of Georgia, so you can email me, give me a call. I'm always delighted to talk with people about fleas. So I'll turn this back over to, I guess, Gwen at this point. Uh, if you, Whoever's got questions, I'll be glad to entertain them at this point. I'll, ta I'll take it from here, Nancy. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan. Fantastic information, Nancy. Uh, a lot of good biology there, and uh, to help people, I think, uh, you know, make key decisions when it comes to controlling fleas. So we do have a, a series of questions. I'll uh, uh, I'll read those. We'll take uh, Carl. I see you got your hand up. I'll I'll take that in just a second. But uh, we had a couple early questions that were posed, and one of them was uh, about silica gel. And you didn't talk about silica gel, but could could you address uh, whether silica gel has any effectiveness on, on fleas? Yes, thank you, Dan. I meant to mention silica gel and diatomaceous earth. Both of these are highly effective against flea larvae. So if you know where the flea larvae are developing, like in the carpet, you sil using silica gel or diatomaceous earth can be very effective. On the other hand, neither silica gel nor diatomaceous earth has any efficacy against adult fleas. So you can dust your dog all day long with diatomaceous earth or silica gel and it won't help the flea problem at all. 
On the contrary, it will dry out the poor dog's skin and make it scratch even more, so it'll look like it has, has a worse flea problem. Oh, dear. <laughs> Okay, uh, next question. How about new products? Got new, any new products or active ingredients on the horizon for flea control? Unfortunately, none that I know of. Uh, we do have a couple of new products that have come out in the last couple of years for flea control on the host. Uh, you'll find those on the Georgia Pest Management Handbook uh, listing there if you want to go there. But I don't see a whole lot being produced for the homeowner or, or for pest control. Uh, someone may know better than I. Uh, if you know of some that are being produced, uh, Dr. Shark may actually be working on some. I don't know. But we may have products that I'm not aware of. Unfortunately, I don't know of any products that are in the pipeline, hit, pipeline headed for uh, urban pest management. OK. Next question comes from Canada. So we have some listeners in Canada this morning. Uh, can you discuss not only treatment strategies for the U.S., which you did uh, quite well, but also Canada in light of limited uh, product selection available to our Canadian PMP? So <sighs> you, you probably know this, Nancy, but registrations for pesticides in Canada are very limited. So uh, they want to know about IPM strategies and, and uh, other strategies that, that you might approach. You did talk about some of the STEAM stuff, but if you right. could kind of talk a little bit about that. That's it. You've, you've got to be creative. Um, <laughs> and that's why I tried to mention things like the using hot steam, sanitation. When we get back to it, a lot of pest management is back to sanitation and hygiene, just keeping things clean. Vacuuming will, if you vacuum every day, you can vacuum up those eggs before they hatch. Every 24 hours, you can get them before they're going to hatch, because it usually takes 48 to uh, two or three days anyway for eggs to hatch. So you can vacuum up the flea eggs before they hatch. This of course involves getting a lot of buy-in from the customer. It's laborious, but if that's what we have to do to control the problem, then maybe that's what we have to do. So sanitation, uh, steam cleaning, again using diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth swept into the carpet fibers will settle down near the base and flea larvae will get their food contaminated with diatomaceous earth and they will um, die that way. Oh, I didn't mention boric acid. Boric acid is another product that can be dusted into the carpet and it will contaminate the flea food, the, the larval flea food. The larvae then will die uh, from toxicity from boric acid. Uh, but you really have to be imaginative and creative when you don't have a lot of insecticides at your disposal. So that's really, that's why I wanted to make the point about understanding the pest, understanding its biology, trying to identify some of its weak points so that you can be creative because you're not going to be able to rely completely on pesticides. Yeah, it's classic IPM and understanding your, your pest there to make really key decisions. It's exactly. very, uh, very good yeah. stuff. Okay, so we're going to go to the chat box now, and uh, I had a question. Uh, it was how long, you were talking about uh, adult fleas when they come out of the cocoon. How, how long can they live out of the cocoon without a host? They can actually days? live for a couple of weeks without feeding. It's really strange. Without feeding, they don't turn on their metabolism, apparently, so they maintain a pretty low level of activity. But then once they've had a blood meal, they have to have a blood meal about once an hour to survive. If you take a flea that has already blood fed and you remove it from the host, it's going to starve to death, death in about a day, whereas um, it will live for, again, a couple of weeks on the host if it's having regular blood meals. The females, I didn't mention this, but the females are pumping about, out an egg about once an hour, so 24, 25 eggs a day. But that means that she has to be taking in a lot of nutrients. So every female flea is having to feed at least once an hour, taking a good blood meal. Then she takes the nutrients from that blood, turns it into eggs, and pumps out an egg again about one an hour. Wow. Our next question was, you got any tips for killing fleas once you vacuumed them in the So what do you do with the vacuum bag? Good point. Yes, just because they're in the bag doesn't mean they're dead, does it? Uh, one thing is to take the bag out, put it out in the, uh, a, you know, in a trash bag, seal it up and put it outside in the trash can, uh, get it out of the house. Another thing is to use one of these water vacuums where everything goes into a water bath and so they can't hop back out. 
Um, do not recommend putting insecticides in the vacuum cleaner bag. That is a misuse of insecticides, so we cannot go there. And it's probably not a good idea to have fumes from any kind of insecticide being blown out of a vacuum cleaner to uh, make the homeowner greater, increase the exposure of the homeowner. So we don't recommend that. So probably the best thing is mechanical removal. Get the bag out, take it outside, get it away, seal it up, and let the garbage man take it away. Yeah, that's good. Or give it to your neighbor, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the street. so this next question has to do with uh, interior exterior treatments for fleas. So the question is, are there insecticides and growth regulators that are more effective than others? I think you did talk a little bit about that. And then the follow-up to that was, uh, are there photostable RGRs such as Nylar that are a must for exterior flea control? Exactly. A good point. Yes, methoprene we know is not as photostable as uh, pyroproxifen, so we do recommend for outdoor use or if you're treating a room like a, a sunroom, an area that gets a lot of sun exposure, then pyroproxifen would be preferable over methoprene. Methoprene, however, has the advantage that I probably shouldn't even discuss this. Maybe Dr. Sharp should go here, but it translocates. We don't know exactly how this works, but you can apply methoprene on one side of a room and a couple of weeks later it will be having activity on the other side of the room. Now whether it contaminates dust and the dust then shifts over to the other side of the room, how this works, I don't know. I'm not a toxicologist. But we've seen this phenomenon. It has messed up a lot of our research because if you don't apply methoprene and seal it up and keep it from moving, it somehow moves, which can be an advantage. That means if you don't spray under the bed, uh, but you spray the rest of the room with methoprene, you get the effect of methoprene even under the bed somehow. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, next question. Uh, uh, the dilution ratio for metacloprid and fipronil that's recommended for treating pets, I guess that would be more of a, a label question. Can you right. address that? The advantage and frontline come formulated for application. You don't have to mix or change or do anything. You just open the little container and apply it directly to the animal. Okay. How about uh, you didn't mention uh, Comfortus? It's a, I guess that pill. Right. How well, how well does that work? And uh, I guess it's spinosad. Right. It's given orally. Correct. Uh huh. Uh, that's another one of those that's given once a month. Uh, there are formulations of Comfortis for both dogs and cats. These are, I might mention, only effective against fleas. So if you have a problem with ticks as well, Comfortis has no efficacy against ticks. But it does seem to work. Uh, gotten good feedback on it. I frankly have not tested it myself, but at least from the uh, anecdotes that I've heard, it seems to work well. Going back to going back to the steam uh, issue, is there is there any data on exposure times for uh, to kill a flea exposed to steam, or is it just killed directly on contact? Uh, no, no research has really been done. This again is anecdotal. It's one of those things um, I've done a little bit, but not replicated studies. So I, all I can say is it worked in our situations. Uh, if it's hot steam, it ought to kill them. But these little larvae are just little maggots. They, you know, you can boil them really quick. <laughs> so good hot steam applied appropriately. Uh, I don't think it's like bed bugs where you, you're not just using a little steamer where you're steaming small areas at a time. If you're using one of those floor cleaners, you're getting pretty good swaths of the carpet treated at uh, one exposure. So. Uh, we've been pretty impressed, at least with the few homes that we've treated with steam. Uh, it, it will knock down fleas. Yeah. But now, let me mention, you're not getting all the fleas because you may have fleas on the uncarpeted parts of the home, uh, on beds and sofas and furnishings. So don't forget about the furniture and other places where fleas may be found. Yeah, there's always a gap at the baseboard, right underneath the baseboard. There's a yes. great area for carpet beetles and fleas and all kinds of things to live exactly. underneath there. Right, right. So this question, we kind of transition here to uh, natural products. So uh, this kind of triggered a, a the question here is from India. Has a question is uh, Azadiracta is a uh, is a natural product. Uh, uh, what do you know anything about that? They say here it's an anti feedant is how it works, but it's kind of a follow up here. My question would be, what about essential oils and things of that sort? 
I don't really know anything about Aphidoracta. It's a good insecticide for a lot of other pests, so it's certainly something worth considering. And the essential oils, I don't know of anyone who's looked at essential oils for flea control, so I really can't address that. Probably another whole area that's wide open for research. Uh, this question comes uh, also from India. What about the vet? What's the the, the veterinarian's role in uh, in controlling fleas? I mean, certainly a bunch of over the, over the counter products that weren't available 15 years ago. That you know, but what what about what about leaving it to the veterinarian? Leaving it to the veterinarian. Eventually, I suppose that would help significantly because again, the fleas are going to have to get to a an animal to take a blood meal to sustain the population. But let me make the point that every animal in the home has to be treated. Otherwise, if you treat all the dogs and there's one cat, <laughs> the cat will maintain enough fleas to keep everybody miserable. If you've got an animal that goes outside, there's always the potential for reinfestation. So I think having the animal treated is a, an important component because the, the animal is conveying the fleas from one habitat to another. So the, uh, certainly a cat that goes out and roams all night, comes back in the daytime and brings with her every flea that she's picked up from the environment, from the, from the neighborhood, and reinfests the home. Uh, so I think controlling fleas on the pet is a component. I certainly encourage it, but I'm not sure that would ever 100% solve the problem. Yeah. The next question has to do with treating uh, outdoor treatments. So where would you, I guess this would be kind of a follow-up to some of your indoor treatments, but where would you treat outdoors? We do know that fleas cannot survive and develop out in sun exposed areas. So you don't need to apply insecticide to the vast majority of the lawn. The areas of the lawn that are sunny, don't worry about. Fleas cannot survive now. Now you may pick up fleas there because they may be hopping out from under the porch and meeting you as you're coming up the front walk, but they're not developing out in the sun exposed areas. Flea larvae are very susceptible to high temperatures, so they really cannot take that. You're going to find fleas developing primarily in the crawl space, under the porch, under heavy vegetation. If you've got shrubs, especially on a sun protected side of the house, like the northern side of the house, where the shrubs are, are keeping the humidity high and you've got no sun exposure, and especially if the dog takes a nap there in the middle of the afternoon, you're going to expect to find a huge concentration of fleas developing there. So that's the area you'd be looking for, under a deck, under a porch, up against the house where it's cool and You've got a sandy exposed area with no sun exposure. Very good. So uh, Kumar wants to know, uh, how many treatments do you think it might take to typically eliminate an infestation? So what, what might a pest control operator need to tell their, their client in terms of, uh, you know, what to expect? Good. Yeah, you're not just going to go in and take care of the problem and never see them again. Uh, first, of course, do an inspection. Find out where the fleas are. Talk with the homeowner. Where are you picking up most of the flea problem? And again, talking with the kids can be helpful because you can find out where the dog is spending a lot of its time. Then go in and treat and go back and monitor a few days later to make sure that the fleas uh, have been knocked down. And you may find at that point that you've missed a place or two. Again, some of the furniture that may be um, still sustaining flea populations that will involve uh, follow-up treatment. We just have a couple more questions here, Nancy. Okay. Uh, hot water. Somebody has a question here about hot water. I, 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 I steam, I, I guess, works pretty well, but uh, I don't know that you could get water hot enough. Uh, I'm not quite sure in what regard they're well, talking about yeah. treating. If you... I guess if you're washing your carpet with really hot water, but you want to be careful, of course, uh, wet carpet can create other problems like mold and you can rot your carpet out. So that's why I'm careful talking about steam cleaning. You want to make sure you soak up all that moisture so that you don't ruin your carpet. Okay, one, one last question here. We do have a couple other questions, but I will, uh, I'll put you in touch with those folks and we can uh, uh, follow, up. follow up a little bit later. But uh, the question here was, uh, somebody had heard that uh, a dog begins to metabolize applied chemicals after continued use. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they mean, but uh, this would be something like uh, Comfortus or Capstar or something like that, I, I assume. Uh, 
I'm not familiar with that, but certainly with any chemical, there's always the possibility that the target pest is going to develop resistance. And I think Dr. Scharf will tell us about that in a few minutes. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if after continual use and continual exposure, any population of a pest develops resistance over time. OK, I appreciate your uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it.